So, what do you little maniacs like to do first? <laughs> hey folks, Joseph A. Sabari here. If you recognize that quote, this was taken from a dark sci-fi teen comedy classic from John Hughes. What else but weird science? Plastic tubes and pots and pans, bits and pieces, and the magic my hands were making. Weird science! Ooh! It's my creation! Is it real? It's my creation! Is it real? <laughs> you get the idea. That was the famous title song by Danny Elfman's the new wave band, Oingo Bingo. I mean, no doubt about it, every time you hear that song, you think of the film. It's inspired by EC Comics about two uh, nerdy teenage boys who are about to create the perfect, sexy, intelligent, filled with limitless magical powers. It teaches them to, like a party animal, you gotta live like the jungle. You know, get to know girls and have fun, relax, without any trouble. <laughs> well, there will be trouble. <laughs> Okay, now this is the uh, Arrow video release that came out in 2019. I was so lucky to pick this up on Amazon as part of my er early birthday gift. I actually have some more Blu-ray titles to show you. Um, and I will do some more uh, later on while we're at it. Because, of course, I've been getting tons of movies uh, from Goodwill, uh, Target, and other places, too. I mean... Throughout the entire two months, or maybe, maybe even more than than two months, I've been getting a, a tons of stuff. I mean, you wouldn't believe it. Um, but I've been waiting to get this uh, Blu-ray for a very long time. Why? Because over the years, uh, Universal had been putting out like tons of copies of the film, and well, of course, the previous releases on home video weren't bad, but the the previous Blu-ray release, on the other hand, is your typical, you know, DNR edge enhancement transfer, where they just don't do the film any justice by remastering it, and that was the problem. So, kudos to Arrow and Universal to actually work together to finally take out a 4K scan of a 35 millimeter print. So now you do get to see a lot of grain structure the way it was meant to be and we do get to see you know all the characters not looking all waxy and all yeah okay and I'm gonna show you right now um, this is the special edition um, I already mentioned that it's a 4k scan of the original negative uh, it has a theatrical version included as we know um, and it has seamlessly bench uh, exclusive extended version which goes up to 97 minutes so they actually had scenes that were actually from the TV cuts but they were actually deleted scenes but they spliced it in together so they were newly remastered thank goodness uh, they used the original lossless stereo audio plus 5.1 DTS uh, HDMA surround sound so it makes this movie um, sound excellent. Um, they were even lucky enough to, you know, put the original music and from the soundtrack intact. I think they do it in both ways for for, for several versions. And and yeah, um, they also do have the TV cut too, uh, edited for television, which aired on Universal Pictures debut network, which was a syndicated movie package playing all these movies. Uh, it aired on KTLA here in Los Angeles, but it also aired at several markets around. You know, airing mostly Universal titles. You know, ones that actually became hits, and other ones that weren't hits, but they broadcast it anyway. That any other network couldn't play. So that's the the idea here. Um, <clears throat> it has a featurette. Uh, mostly from all the others, uh, they had uh, casting word signs with an interview with um, casting director Jackie Birch. Um, excellent uh, six-minute uh, featurette where she talks about how 
she was lucky to work with John Hughes when he was alive and also the fact that he she offered to cast all the other actors to choose the parts, you know, especially ones that are becoming popular later on. You know, like Robert Downey Jr. for instance too. And yeah, plays one of the bullies. Um, they got Anthony Michael Hall, who they just previously got him since um, you know, National Lampoon's Vacation, but they got him for films like Sixteen Candles and The Breakfast Club come to mind. Of course, Bill Paxton, God rest his soul, you know, playing Chet, and of course they got Kelly LeBrock, who was a fashion model herself. I mean, she was previously in the movie The Woman in Red, you know, the Gene Wilder film that he directed. If, I mean, if everyone would recognize her. Um, they were originally going to get Sharon Stone, hard to believe, and they were going to get another actress to to play the part. Yeah, it was Robin Wright they were going to give him. But they figured Kelly Block would nail that performance, and rightly so. Then there's Dino the Greek, uh, which was um, a new interview with John Capellos. Yeah, he was, uh, he played a character in the movie where he was at the bar called the Candy Bar. It's a jazz bar. You know how he plays his character. And then there's um, a newly filmed interview with special makeup creator Craig Reardon, yeah, which which is Chet Happens. <laughs> um, yeah, basically, you know, they created um, the blobby creature that uh, Lisa had turned Chet into because you know he's trying to get even with him after making fun of uh, Wyatt all the time. Yeah, he plays basically your typical older brother who's an asshole. <laughs> um, then there's like Fantasy and Michael Chips, a uh, film interview with editor Chris uh, LeBazon. Yeah, it's it's a long one where, you know, he did a lot of uh, edits and all this other stuff too. You know, they took some time to work on the film and try to get to the lines the dialogue and all the stuff that they got away with. Um, uh, Ira Newborn, you know, the uh, composer of, of the movie, I mean he composed uh, several John Hughes films. Um, he's a synthesizer composer, which he kind of talks pretty softly. It's understandable. I'm trying to see if he can get the music uh, particularly right for the tone. and. Um, it's Alive, yeah, Resurrection, the Weird Science, which is an archive documentary that came directly from the Flashback Edition uh, DVD release, yeah, which has all the interviews of all the, the people behind. And, well, yeah, you got Anthony Michael Hall, you know, one of the stars. Um, you actually got uh, D'Alba Cody, yeah, the writer of Juno, to join in for the interviews. Yeah, you got all these other people. Uh, you know, talking about the film and all, you know, how it relates to what's going on and all. Even has theatrical trailers, TV spots, radio spots, image galleries, and of course, a reversible sleeve, which I'm going to show you right now. Um, they were supposed to have a booklet inside, um, which actually has some more information, but on, instead it just has this. <laughs> yeah, just a, a card for, um, you know, Arrow um, Video. Yes, there's a Arrow Video channel uh, that you can watch on um, on your Apple TV. Uh, see, and here's the disc. <laughs> and um, I'm going to show you the reversible cover art. See, this is the original poster. <laughs> as you may recognize okay. and you can see right here as I already show you but I'm gonna keep it like this because it's so much better I mean I, I like the original poster too but this one's more sexier okay. I'm gonna put it back the way it was and so 
definitely pick this set up. Uh, it costs $26.99 on Amazon. I mean, you can also find it at uh, Barnes & Noble or several places if they carry it. I, I just couldn't find it at actual retail stores around. So this was the only way I had to pick it up. And by the way, the transfer in the movie just looks uh, incredible. So I'm glad that, and, and the sound too. So it blows away all the previous releases around that Universal put out. I mean, they, they took the risk to do so. And I'm glad because this is why we trust a company, a bouquet company, to actually do it right. And that's what we want in a movie. So, okay. Now, uh, also for Weird Science's popularity, it did actually have a TV series that aired on USA Network, only 88 episodes. Uh, they had a DVD release of the complete series, but it's now out of print. I hope maybe someday another company might be able, or perhaps the same company, I don't know, will actually release the, the series again. Maybe this time they'll put it on Blu-ray if they're lucky. Yeah, I mean, I would love to see the show on Blu-ray anyway. If that's the case. Um, so hey, at least we got what we can. They were going to plan on doing like a sequel or even a remake for this, and frankly, I would not want to see that. I'm already fine with this as it is. I'm already fine with the TV show. You know, which the TV show starred Vanessa Angel, um, who later went on to do the film uh, Kingpin. Uh, Michael. Uh, Matt Sosan and John Mallory Asher, along with Lee uh, Turgeson, you know, playing the parts. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself, but that's just what I had to talk about. So let's begin with the movie review. It stars Anthony Michael Hall. You may remember him from National Lampoon's Vacation, but also have been in films like Sixteen Candles, The Breakfast Club. Um, Edward Scissorhands, and also the TV show The Dead Zone, among others. Ian Mitchell Smith, who um, who's now a professor, hard to believe. Um, Kelly LeBrock, former fashion model, but uh, she actually um, um, actually was once married to um, action star uh, Steve Seagal. Yeah. Aikido uh, martial artists, but I know they weren't working out very well. But of course, she was in the movie *The Woman in Red* and among other stuff that she's done. Uh, Bill Paxton, you know, *God Rest His Soul*, once again, and he's been in other movies. You know, *The Terminator*, *Aliens*, uh, *Predator 2*, *Twister*, *A Simple Plan* and many others and he will be missed Robert Downey Jr. of course uh, he was in movies like um, Back to School he was also in a movie with uh, Anthony Michael Hall too called um, Johnny Be Good and I know they're best friends too they, they even were together as former um, cast members of Saturday Night Live yeah believe it or not uh, during that time um, but of course, you know, Robert Downey Jr. have done a lot of movies, you know, Air America, Iron Man, you know, The Avengers, and all that other stuff that he's done in his career. Great actor. Uh, Robert Russler, who was in a movie called BAMP, um, but he was also in a movie called Shag, uh, where he played the character Buzz, so if you remember him. Uh, Suzanne Snyder. Uh, Judy uh, Rawson, who would later be in that TV show called Pursuit of Happiness, uh, not to be confused with the, the Will Smith movie, it, it was a short-lived TV series. Uh, Vernon Wells, um, of course, you may remember him from, from The Road Warrior, yeah, Mad Max 2, I believe he was a villain, uh, Wes. Um, he was in other stuff like Homicide, um, Maglock Police, and All the Rivers Run. Uh, Jennifer uh, Bob Goblin, Jeff Jensen, Brad Leach, Ivy Berry, and Coyle. 
uh, Doug uh, McHugh, Pamela Gordon, Michael Berryman. Yes, you may recognize him because, you know, he was in a lot of horror films, <laughs> such as The Hills Have Eyes uh, from Wes Craven. Yeah, the remake, of course, uh, is even better. Uh, John Capallos, yep, would you recognize him from the movie The Breakfast Club, among other stuff he's done. Uh, D. Mitch Davis, uh, Joe Wellow, who was from Night of the Creeps and Thunder Run, uh, Wally Ward, and Renee Props. Also produced uh, not only by John Hughes, it's also produced by Joe Silver. Yeah, for Silver Pictures, yeah, the same guy who produced uh, several uh, action films like Die Hard, Lethal Weapon, even the Matrix movies. <laughs> yeah. And of course, it's written and directed by John Hughes. God rest his soul. The movie begins set somewhere in the Chicagoland area. We meet two nerdish social outcasts, uh, teenage boys, Gary Wallace and Wyatt Donnelly. Both played by Anthony Michael Hall and Elian Mitchell Smith. Yes, and Wyatt is the one with the nerdish voice. <laughs> um, they're just going around to a local gymnasium at high school uh, to swoon around their popular cheerleading uh, girlfriends, Deb and Hilly, both played by Suzanne Snyder and Judy Arason only to be embarrassed and humiliated by two senior jocks who are bullies named Ian and Max, both played by Robert Rustler and Robert Downey Jr. By pulling their pants down, exposing their underwears right in front of the girls while doing their gymnastic moves. But being rejected and disappointed by their crush and their directions in life and wanting more, uh, Gary convinced um, Wyatt, who are feeling very uptight, like they need to try to boost some more popularity for themselves in order to actually stop uh, Ian and Max and be able to get back to their girlfriends or any other. So, inspired by watching a 1931 classic Frankenstein, they decided to invent the perfect woman that can actually teaches them you know all the lessons they have to learn so at that point on they created uh, a very sexy sensual um, outrageously gorgeous <laughs> and very intelligent um, woman named Lisa who was played by Kelly LeBrock yeah what they had to do was they had to go to Wyatt's computer, um, had a lot of primitive early CGI graphics at the time, you know, with all the grids and all these other simulations that you see, you know, while they simulate uh, the, the female figure, you know, with enlarged breasts that you can change, you can do anything, you know, come up with some very uh, sensuous legs and, and all, you know, body parts. You know, then throw in all these cutout uh, magazines from Playboy or any other fashion magazine around with all these models. And then even hook up the jumper cables from the car battery to this uh, Barbie-like doll. You know, dressing her up uh, very sexually. Yeah, you know, wearing the, the, you know, wearing this, this grayish uh, t-shirt, you know, cut out. And some woman's panties, you know, purple. And that's where she appears. So, Once they finally created her, though, she just went to the shower, naked, of course, with them. And they were, they were just really, you know, ogling her. And then, we also learned that she has magical powers. Very limitless, so she can even do whatever she wants. You know, control them, having to wear all these casual suits and get ready to go to a party in Chicago which is at a local jazz bar uh, that's mixed race like you had like you know Greeks uh, I think there's some Latinos Asians and mostly blacks too that's where you meet Dino the Greek 
He was played by John Kapalos. Yeah. And they were driving around in a pink Cadillac that she took. And of course, they named her Lisa after Gary's uh, ex-girlfriend. And they just basically teaches them how to have fun, you know, without getting into trouble, if that's the case. But probably the funniest part was when the, Gary was actually drinking some bourbon that they forced him to, and that's where he got all drunk, and he started... Uh, jiving and talking like uh, a black guy. <laughs> I mean, this is the kind of jokes that really got into it somehow and got away with it for, for that uh, particular period. So, it, I mean, it was politically incorrect. I mean, all the jokes and all. So, after that uh, rousing night, uh, they went back home, and that's where we met Chet, uh, Wyatt's um, military uh, tough. A uh, bully, another bully, and, and an asshole too. Who's played by Bill Paxton? I mean, he yeah, this guy is like really something else. I mean, he gets to smoke cigars, you know, he gets to wear all these military clothes and stuff. He even goes hunting. You know, he has this shotgun and all. But he's always you know picking on Wyatt, you know, by stealing his money and all, and even gives him a wedgie, all that stuff. So, so with all the, for this particular uh, night, uh, they woke up, well, we noticed that Wyatt is actually wearing the, the same clothes that, uh, <laughs> that um, Lisa was wearing, but kind of did a switcheroo here, so now she's pretty much wearing his, uh, his uh, pajamas and all. You know, they, you know, they, they made, they fall in love, you know, while Gary was drunk, but now he's finally sober when he got up, and so a afterwards, uh, they just went shopping, you know, getting ready for the next party, and it's going to be the biggest party at Wyatt's uh, house, you know, his mansion, where at this point on, I mean, she's already, you know, Shopping for clothes like lingerie, you know, getting some, you know, makeup and or at this rate, uh, some, some perfume and all. While Ian and Max is going around, you know, picking on Gary and Wyatt by dumping ices on them, you know, right in front of their girlfriends, and yes, both Deb and Hilly, you know, dumped uh, Ian and Max, you know, for the foul plays. <laughs> Until Ann and Max actually spotted Lisa, you know, on the escalator, you know, while the song "Pretty Woman" plays, or or any other song, and that's when the, <laughs> you know, Gary and Wyatt, you know, were driving around in their Porsche, you know, which having their license plates with their names on it too, <laughs> while they take the girls out just for the party, uh, yeah. Then. As soon as night began, I mean, that's where the party goes completely wild when Lisa invited all the rest of, of the guests to join in. Like, there's like tons of guests, even the, the teens at high school. And Ian and Max join in as well. And of course, Deb and Hilly. Which will lead to a lot of nervousness for both Gary and Wyatt. So they end up being stuck in the bathroom trying to make their impression with them. <laughs> but it wasn't easy. Because already, you know, Wyatt has taken a dump, which causes a, a bad smell here, and so they have to light it up and all, and, and hopefully that um, that uh, Lisa will give them plenty of advice and try to teach them, you know, how to get to know them better and everything. But then Ian and Max, you know, who's already falling in love with uh, Lisa, they were hoping that they'll get to know them better. If that's the case, but because Gary, since Lisa is their creation, well, they thought maybe th they wanted to experience their secret that, you know, this is how they did all this stuff to create another woman. But things go completely wrong when it just went completely out of control. They forgot to use another Dow or, or two. Yeah, also, I, I forgot to mention they were wearing. Uh, brawls on their heads <laughs> yeah they really were you know just for for its purpose 
Um, what they forgot was all the dowels, and instead they actually connected the jumper cables into a Time Magazine article, which features a missile, yeah, because of the Cold War situation happening in the 80s. Yeah, they were going for that. And then it, it reveals um, a very tough motorcycle gang, all mutants. And then there's um, a post-apocalyptic uh, gains from Mad Max the Road Warrior. Yeah, so now you recognize uh, Lord General. It was played by Vernon Wells and the mutant gang, the leader of the pack. Uh, who's joined in with his uh, other gang who's who has like a a fractured uh, face you know they keep, they cover it up too and anyway the 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 leader of the mutant gang is played by Michael Berryman such an awesome actor and of course uh, uh, Lord General you know played by uh, Brennan Wells so everything was going completely out of control yes the um, one of the teenage girls uh, who was actually playing the piano eventually <laughs> winds up getting stripped off. It was blowing her away, went straight into the chimney. She go, she flew all the way up in the air and went, landed all the way down into this rainy storm, drenched in, into the the grassy field, like like it was a pool. <laughs> yeah, you can see a lot of uh, boobs. Um, all topless, you know, stretching out from her bras and panties and all. Um, yeah, there, there's a lot of that too. Like, there's there's a little bit of brief nudity in there too. Not gratuitous, but they show some tits and, and all. Um, so they got away with it also. <laughs> and then you see like one teen actually, you know, walling around too. Uh, everyone was going upside down or so. And um, I know Lisa did actually control uh, Gary, uh, not Gary, uh, Wyatt's uh, grandparents that by freezing them and putting them inside uh, the cabinet where the kitchen was all blue. I mean, I mean, wow. And so, in order to stop the gains, um, which both Gary and Wyatt are pretty much cowards at this point on. Um, they had to hide themselves out. Elisa gave them an advice to actually took out a fake uh, water pistol uh, magnum, which, uh, before the party began, um, just to uh, seek with them out, um, Gary had to invite Lisa to his parents uh, to tell them that they're going to go to a party, you know, hoping that nothing's going to go wrong. but. Unfortunately, Gary's father, you know, got uh, hostile towards uh, Lisa and then and Gary, and that's when Lisa decided to brainwash him and also try to threaten him with a magnum. Yeah. Well, by the time uh, Gary uses that magnum, he thought that this was just a water pistol, but it turns out that it actually has real bullets. So he accidentally shot the the chandelier, I believe. So that was pretty funny. <laughs> okay. Uh, when the party was over, uh, both Gary and Wyatt are about to um, confront with Deb and Haley, uh, Hilly, sorry, and hoping you know things will go for the better. They now get to know each other, and now they both fell in love. Um, but then the next morning. Uh, Chet uh, came back, you know, from his weekend, you know, going hunting, and then he goes around bringing his shotgun, you know, knocking both Gary and and Deb, you know, teasing them and all, and and that's when the Lisa came to to the rescue to actually, you know, get even with um, Chet uh, with his uh, gruffiness and toughness. By actually turning him into a blobbly uh, creature, so he got what he deserved. Well, you know, both Gary and Wyatt were about to take their girlfriends back home. You know, they they made love. Everything turned out uh, quite special. But that also leads to this particularly sad but happy ending, um, where. Before uh, 
Wyatt's uh, parents uh, were arriving from their trip because yeah, they, they ran away so they weren't there but they came back I mean you probably already saw them you know dancing around in, into the photograph <laughs> in that scene and yeah well the song weird science played um, everything was going back to normal everything went in its place all all this uh, craziness that was happening had finally went back so that way the parents won't notice and then Lisa had to leave going back to where she came from uh, back inside um, you know Wyatt's um, door and now um, well things are going to be a lot different for you know Gary and Wyatt you know Chad will finally you know you know, teaches a lesson to to not pick on Wyatt, and they finally make love with their girlfriends, and things are normal. Well, that is until <laughs> Lisa came along, um, posing as a coach, and in the same gymnasium, but with the boys, and <laughs> she says, "Drop and give me 20 and then <laughs> they all fainted, and then the song plays at the end. <laughs> Oh man, this was, you know, incredible how John Hughes can really get away with this. And the fact that this was probably the first and only film that he actually used special effects. I mean, this was a pretty high, well, for only $7.5 million out of its budget scale. I mean, this was the inflation prices at the time. It just looks so impressive. I mean, they must have took a lot of time to put all these these incredible special effects together into one. I mean, they were ahead of its time, of course. Um, they were done practically and, and done physically and, and all. Put a lot of hard work and energy. And and the fact that it had a lot of politically incorrect jokes and, and sex jokes in there, too. Uh, even exposing, you know, the female nudity, you know, like breasts. Um, the wily amount of computer hacking directly from the government, the red skies at night filled with bolts of lightning, the power surge uh, goes haywired, the entire room becomes a mess with flashing lights and all, creating directly from a stimulation of the female body, um, using all these cutout magazines of Playboy fashion, you know, you cook into the cables of, of this doll here would expose nudity I mean you name it all on, in this one film and all the dark tones with raunchy um, sexual humor right there and the the sense amount of violence that they put into it I mean for its PG-13 rating at the time this was a different breed because PG-13 was introduced in 1984, I mean, which is basically a take between the the R and the PG, hoping they can accept this for the for its teenage audience and all. Um, this was incredible. I mean, nowadays with PG-13 in today's uh, generation, I mean, of course, you'll have all the intense scenes. And you will have the foul language and maybe a little amount of nudity. I mean, like every time they expose, you know, woman's breasts, you know, we only see her behind. But we do get to see their ass, you know, but not their pussies. <laughs> okay. Uh, we do get to see males, um, ass and all, but just not exposing their, their shalongs and all. <laughs> okay. Um... But with that aside, uh, the characters were just excellent. I mean, even some knowns and unknowns to join in. I mean, Anthony Michael Hall and Elian Michael Smith really plays the geeks perfectly. I mean, you really care for them. You really know how hard they were going through for all the humiliation that they had to deal with, with bullies and having to get to know, you know, popular you know, cheerleaders, you know, t t also to make love and all. And had to be stuck with their social lives 
and mostly dealing with uh, technology and everything. I mean, that's what they have to deal with. Having to create the perfect woman to actually um, teach all the ropes. You know, living like uh, a party animal and all. <laughs> yeah, filled with tremendous dialogue, all quirky and and fast paced here and there, done by John Hughes himself. Yeah. Um, but Kelly Brock was the real star of the film. I mean, a fashion model herself. She she really uh, nailed this performance. Uh, this is her best work she's ever done. I mean, she really plays it exactly what pretty much all fashion models were at the time, or maybe as beautiful as they could be. But I thought her performance just exactly creates a, a perfect um, life here. It's almost like she treats them like like they were their teacher. Like imagine having a teacher this hot and sexy and gorgeous and beautiful too and with all the the fashion that they wore the makeup and all of that and and the British accents or any other types <laughs> I mean this this is one beauty right there she she can do anything and she can use a lot of you know, magical powers that she can create you know she can change all the suits that they want to wear they can switch back and forth they can even create all these cars with different names of of their license plates, so they'll know it's theirs. And they, you know, I mean, they're they're out of this world. I mean, right there. I mean, she's definitely the inspirational of a hot chick, and that's why I love about her performance. And Brett, uh, Bill Paxton, God rest his soul. I mean, he was terrific as the uh, the macho. Uh, military uh, asshole of a older brother I mean always treating Wyatt like shit but in the end I mean he learns this lesson and all uh, uh, the girls um, Deb and Hilly both played by Susan Snyder and uh, Jane uh, Judy Arasen are, are both cute um, beautiful too I mean it's no wonder Gary and Wyatt wanted to be with them and both Ian and Max, of course, Robert Down, of course, Robert Rustler and Robert Downey Jr. were to were excellent as the bullies. I mean, especially Robert Downey Jr. because you know he's really you know <laughs> you always know his personality. You know he's always you know talks the talk, walk the walk. You know, quick pace here and there. I mean, it's no wonder he's our. Uh, <laughs> Our Iron Man. <laughs> yeah, uh, Tony Stark. <laughs> I mean, who would have thought? Uh, the soundtrack is incredible, too. Besides uh, the title song by uh, Wango Brango, I mean, you got songs by uh, Van Halen, which is a cover version of Pretty Woman yeah, from Roy Orbison. And you got a lot of uh, terrific songs to join in, too. Um, the cinematography was incredible. Uh, the score done by Ira Newenberg, like all the other scores you, from the John Hughes films, are just basically synthesizers that really fits the mood towards it. And I love that. Cinematog and the the editing throughout the film. Yeah, they have free editors too, including Chris uh, Lebazon really uh, fits uh, very well too. Um, I know the deleted scenes that they used that they couldn't use in the theatrical version but it was also on those two other versions. Um, they actually have one scene with uh, all the guys dressed up as Devo, you know, wearing those uh, red top hats, you know, metal hats and, and they're driving around in scooters. <laughs> and I think there was another scene um, where they got to see more of of the Frankenstein movie and everything like that. So that's all it was. But it, it was incredible. I mean, yeah, they got away with everything too. It may not be for for very oversensitive viewers. I mean if they had to experience it, you know, with all the sexes and all this other stuff too come to mind, but I don't care. 
You know, I love films like this. You know, I, I'm glad it got made at the time. I mean, when 80s was a whole different generation, you know, filled with uh, pop new wave and lots of fashion, casual clothes, cars, all this other stuff too. And a lot of great movies and TV shows all around. I mean, I just love it. I mean, even though I was born the same year this movie came out, but I was born earlier. <laughs> I mean, wow, you know, I wish I could experience it again. Um, so anyway, that's Weird Science, and I give the movie five stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.